All right, let me get the clicker and let's begin. So in the year of 2016, two big events happened at Netflix. In early January, at the flip of a switch, we launched Netflix globally, enabling customers from across 195 countries in the world to instantly enjoy Netflix. In the same year, towards the end, I believe it was around December of 2016, if I'm not wrong, we released one of our most requested features. It was our ability to download and playback content offline. It was motivated by the fact that across the world, if you have a spotty network connection, uh, it will come in handy to mm, download the Netflix content and watch it offline. But according to me, it comes in really handy if you have kids who watches Big Boss, Boss Baby, not Big Boss, again and again and again in a loop. These two events translated into two top-level goals for our services engineering organization. One was high availability. It was al always a prime time viewing in some part of the world. And number two, it was innovation velocity. The entire downloads feature was conceived, designed, developed, tested, and deployed in a matter of months. However, one key service, our API service, whose responsibility is to orchestrate all functionality flowing into the Netflix ecosystem, was struggling to keep, keep up with these two top-level goals. To explain things more concretely, I'm going to show you a couple of graphs. This graph indicates the number of times Netflix had some form of an outage in the year of 2016. The peaks indicate the number of customers who got impacted by the outage, and the width indicates the duration in which the outage lasted. And specifically, the red dots indicate the number of times our API servers was directly or indirectly a contributing factor to the outage. So our high availability goal was at risk. Separately, we have plotted two metrics. This plots uh, deployments per week and rollbacks per month. As you can see, over the years, we are seeing a, a decreasing trend in deployments and an alarming increase in the number of rollbacks due to the complexity of our API service. Now, I want you folks to imagine this. Say you own and operate this API service. As I said before, it is a critical service orchestrating and acting as an access point for all requests coming into the Netflix ecosystem. On the one hand, it's increasingly becoming a bottleneck for feature velocity. And on the other hand, our availability numbers are not where we want it to be. In order to fix this, you're tasked with the responsibility of re-architecting this service. Where do you begin? The goal of this talk is to provide you with a framework to think and reason about how to make such a big re-architectural change. I'm Sudan Rengarajan. I work in the Playback API team within Netflix, and we are responsible for a dozen of microservices within the Playback domain. I guess if you guys have been to the Jessica talk this morning, she said she was an ex-monolithic engineer. I think, I guess it makes me an ex-distributed monolithic engineer. Before we dive into the specific, let's take a quick uh, look at the previous architecture workflow. We support the Netflix application amongst thousands of devices, and millions of requests originating from these devices come into a Netflix ecosystem of services run and operated by various teams at Netflix. The requests typically come via the API proxy service, whose responsibility is to provide protocol termination, monitoring, and routing. And behind the API proxy service, we have the API service, whose responsibility is to orchestrate all requests flowing into the Netflix ecosystem. And behind the API service, we have uh, hundreds of microservices whose responsibility is a uh, very domain-specific niche responsibility. Within the API servers, we have three major workflows. The first is the sign-up workflow. It is uh, enabled by a set of sign-up APIs in coordination with, say, membership, authorization, billing, and other similar microservices. Once you log in, you see rows and rows of content in your Netflix uh, view, and then um, it is, it's all personalized for your taste. This is enabled by a set of discovery APIs in coordination with personalization, artwork, title metadata, localization, and dozens of other services. And finally, you hit play button. From the moment you hit play till you exit a playback, it is enabled by a set of uh, APIs we call the playback API and its associated microservices. <clears throat> 
So let's keep the view of this architecture in mind so that like uh, as we go through this talk, we'll pick apart the technical aspects of the previous architecture and we'll try and compare and contrast between the previous architecture and our current architecture choices. At the very high level, we recommend thinking about in terms of three fundamental principles. Number one, identity. Number two, type one and type two decisions. And number three, evolvability. Let's begin with identity. Start yourself with asking why. Why does your service exist? If you removed your service from your ecosystem, what would be the impact? Go a step further and ask why does your service exist with respect to why your company exists? Let me paint a picture for you folks. Why does Netflix exist? Netflix's goal is to lead the internet TV revolution to entertain billions of people across the world. And within Netflix, we have the product engineering organization. Why does that exist? Its purpose is to maximize customer engagement across all Netflix functions from sign up all the way to streaming. And then you go one level down. Within the product engineering organization, we have the Edge Engineering Org. Its sole purpose is to enable acquisition, discovery, and playback experience with high availability. Within the Edge Engineering Organization, we have the API service, and the API service identity is to deliver acquisition, playback, and discovery functions around the clock. As we went through this process of like hierarchically determining um, what is the identity of our service with respect to our organization, with respect to other services, the first thing which we questioned was, does it still make sense for one API service to play a role in all these major functions uh, which enable the Netflix application? In retrospect, we are realizing that we didn't really apply a single responsibility principle, and we rolled multiple identities into one service, which made the API service unnecessarily complex. This enabled us to make a first decision in our re-architecture. We said that in order for us to grow the business for the next several years, we wanted a separate API service for each of these functions. So we split the API service into a sign-up API service, discovery API service, and a playback API service. So now within the Edge Engineering organization, we have a Play API service whose responsibility is to just deliver the playback lifecycle with high availability. In order to do that, the Play API service interacts with three categories of mid-tier microservices. It talks with a set of servers which decides what the best playback experience is. It talks with a set of services which authorizes each and every playback. And then there's a third set of services which collects the playback data for business intelligence. So in order to ensure that the, there is a specific role for the Play API service, what we did was we removed the Play API service from this equation and tried to reason about what would happen in that case. Immediately we noticed that it introduces high amount of coupling points. Before the coupling point used to be three, now it used to be like 12 or 13. That implied that the evolvability of each of the other services was going to be difficult. Similarly, each of the APIs which the uh, microservices, the mid-tier microservices exposes, we are exposing those APIs directly to the devices, and again, it is a point of low evolvability. In essence, this cartoon kind of captures the role of why do we need a Play API service. We broken open from a monolith, and then we have separate domain-specific, playback domain-specific microservices, and then we need a specific layer whose responsibility is to orchestrate amongst those services. By doing this, we came up with the Play API's identity. We said its purpose is to orchestrate the playback lifecycle while providing stable abstractions between devices and all the domain-specific playback services. So the guiding principle here is that we believe in simple singular identities. The identity must relate to your organization, to your company, and should complement the identity of all the peer services in your ecosystem. So that's the big first, first guiding principle. Then let's talk about type one and type two decisions. Let's do a quick show of hands. How many of you guys have used type one and type two decisions framework before? Not too bad, I think like 5%. 
So the concept came from Jeff Bezos, actually. In his annual shareholders letter, he talks about the type of decisions which sustains innovation at Amazon. He says, and I quote, some decisions are consequential and irreversible, or nearly irreversible, one-way doors. And these decisions must be made methodically, carefully, slowly, with great deliberation and consultation. We call these type one decisions. He goes on and says, but most decisions aren't like that. They are changeable, reversible, two-way doors. If you have made a suboptimal type two decision, you don't have to live with the consequences for that long. Type 2 decisions can and should be made by high judgment individuals or small groups. This is a great piece of wisdom which we can apply to architectural design. So at Netflix, we believe there are three type 1 decisions to consider. Number one is around appropriate coupling. Number two is the choice between asynchronous and synchronous. And number three is the data architecture. Let's go over each of them. When we talk about appropriate coupling, we have to talk about shared libraries. And when we talk about shared libraries, typically we talk about two types of shared libraries. There's a set of shared libraries which provides some common function. Say this could be the IDs jar or the metrics jar or an in-memory cache solution. And then there's a set of shared libraries which acts as client libraries, which enables us to talk between microservices. For instance, like most of our uh, microservices code originated from a monolithic code base. So there, are, there, is, there was a high proliferation of shared libraries from that era. In fact, there is this one particular library which we call the streaming utilities jar. And if you looked at the dependency tree of the library, it had 121 dependencies. To make things worse, it, the library is consumed by almost 80% of our microservices. So we have thick shared libraries, which are hundreds of dependent libraries. So when you have these hundreds of libraries assembled as part of the microservices, and it's kind of crossing boundaries across different services, what we have is a distributed monolith. Any fatal change in one of these libraries had the potential to bring multiple services down. Distributed monolith is worse than a monolith because <laughs> it had all the ill effects of the monolith, on top of having to own and operate each of these microservices separately. So that's one form of coupling. Sam Newman captures this very well, actually, in his book, uh, Building Microservices. He says the evils of too much coupling between services are far worse than the problems caused by code duplication. We have another form of coupling with respect to the client libraries. See, the Play API service talk to the playback decision service via the playback decision client. Whenever the playback decision service is unavailable, it uses a fallback from within the playback decision client in order to improve the reliability of the service. However, in one particular instance, when the playback decision service was down, it, res it resulted in the fallback execution from within the Play API service. However, we saw that the latencies of the API service went through, went through the roof. This is because the fallback was so heavy and so CPU intensive, even though it provided reliability for the playback decision service, from the pers perspective of the playback API service, the, it was, the availability was still impacted and Netflix was still down. So what we have here is some form of operational coupling. We have two domain contexts, each with its own responsibilities. Playback decision service does the playback decisions and the API service just the orchestration. However, via the playback decisions client, the operational context of the playback decision service is leaking into the Play API service. Actually, operational coupling worked very well for us for several years, it's mainly because many teams may not be uh, ready to uh, fully own and operate a highly available microservice. However, as, as years progressed, uh, the API service being a Nexus service, which is, a, uh, which is um, incorpor incorporating several client libraries, it became an untenable situation to operate uh, the API service itself. Another interesting issue which happens with the proliferation of shared libraries is some form of language coupling. It encourages people to stay in Java. Netflix has historically been a Java shop, However, there has been use cases which we are exploring specifically around, like, say, we wanted to build a back-end for front-end services in Node. 
and we want to be able to uh, take advantage of Node's functionality and the device team's expertise to be able to build such a service. In order to do that, any team who is owning the Node service will have to handwrite the list of clients in order to communicate with the rest of the ecosystem. It was such a high friction point that it discouraged most people from even considering such an option. With respect to client drive there's another form of subtle coupling which happens uh, with respect to the communication protocol. Many services at Netflix is uh, written on top of the Jersey framework via our REST interface. And the most communication happens over REST over HTTP 1. It works well, except it has one limitation. As soon as the connection is established between the client and the server, all communication is initiated by the client. So it's unidirectional. That means it can only support request and response style APIs. Drawing from these experiences, we went to the, uh, we sat down and we kind of debated what our requirements should be, and then we came up with four requirements. Number one, we wanted operationally thin clients. By this, we meant like when, whatever client libraries which we are incorporating, it should not have any heavy fallbacks, no special logic, and the dependencies which it brings in should be well defined and limited. Second, we don't want to use, if possible, not use any shared libraries or have a well-defined set of shared libraries which is acceptable to use within a, a API service. Specifically, if like if we, we talked about the streaming utilities jar, we, we, we made a call to not incorporate that in our API service anymore. The third requirement is around auto-generated clients. This is mainly for the polyglot support. This meant that we want to define the API of our servers in some form of interface definition language, and we wanted some kind of tooling to generate the thin clients uh, in multiple languages of our needs. And finally, we wanted bidirectional communication because we wanted to explore beyond request and response style APIs. One quick point of note here is one of the things which we initially discussed around, like, do we really care about REST versus RPC? We really didn't have this as a requirement because at Netflix, most use cases were modeled as request response, and REST was a simple and easy choice to use, but it was more an incidental choice rather than an intentional one. By analyzing some of the services, we realized that most of the services were not really using RESTful principles anyways. The URLs didn't represent a unique resource. Instead, the parameters which came along with the URL determined the outcome of the call, effectively making them a REST RPC call. So we said we are agnostic to REST versus RPC as long as it meets our other requirements. Based on this, we squared in on gRPC as our framework of choice. gRPC provides protocol buffers as their ideal and uh, we are able to uh, define our APIs and uh, have clients automatically generated uh, in all the languages of our interest. It also supported uh, NETI and HTTP2 for bidirectional communication. However, we did still have to uh, enable the ecosystem components. We need to build some ecosystem compatibility within the gRPC framework to make it work within Netflix. So this is the previous architecture compared to the current architecture with respect to coupling. We have very minimal operational coupling, limited or intentional binary coupling. We are able to go beyond Java, and we are free to explore beyond request and response style APIs. So the first type of decision we made was around appropriate coupling is around we want to consider thin auto-generated clients with bidirectional communication and minimize code reuse across service boundaries. The next type one decision is around synchronous and asynchronous choices. In order to understand this, let's consider an example. Let's say we have an API called Get Play Data API. It takes in the customer ID, title ID, and the device ID. Using the customer ID, it talks to the customer info service to fetch the customer info. Using the device ID, it talks to the device service, gets the device info. And using the enriched customer info and the device info, it talks to a third server, say let's call it the play, playback decision service, in order to decide the playback data and then return the play data. Let's see how we will code this up in both synchronous and asynchronous architectures. A typical synchronous architecture looks like this. 
We have a dedicated thread pool for all the incoming requests. Each request execution gets one dedicated thread. Separately, for each of the clients which is talking to some other external mi microservices, has its own dedicated set of thread pools, which is managing all the outgoing communication. So for the play data call, what happens here is that we have three calls. First call is the get customer info. Okay, okay, let me back up a little bit. So basically we get a request for get play data, and then it gets a thread from the request uh, handler thread pool. And then that thread blocks till the get play data call returns. And within the play, get play data call, the first unit of execution is to call into the customer service in order to fetch the customer info. For that, it coordinates with a client thread pool corresponding to the customer info and makes an outbound call to the customer service. For this entire duration, the, the execution thread is blocked till you get a response back from the customer service. The same thing happens with the device info and with the decide, decide play data till the play data is uh, returned uh, and then it's available, to, available for return. So in a typical synchronous architecture, you have a blocking request handler and a blocking client I.O. It works well for simple request response style APIs where latency is not that big of a concern. And also it works if you have to just worry about limited number of clients which we are communicating with. I've been talking about request response for a while now. Are there use cases which goes beyond request response? Let's say for the same play data call, how can we model beyond the request response patterns? So the request response patterns looks like this. You request play data for title X, and you get a response back for the play data for the title X. So it's one request and one response. We could define an API which accepts a play data request for titles X, Y, and Z. Then as and when we have the play data available for each of those titles, we can stream the response back to the calling device. So this would be a request stream pattern. Or we can flip it and we say that like, the devices can request or play data as and when it thinks it's necessary. Then we can collate all the uh, requests and then send a single response back uh, with all the play data for all the titles. So that will be a request, the stream response pattern. And finally, we can have streaming happening on both sides where devices can request for play data as and when it needs and then the service can respond with play data as and when it's available, so it will be a bi-directional stream pattern. If you think any, any of these stream-specific uh, uh, API patterns will fit into one of your business domains, it's worth considering an asynchronous architecture. Asynchronous architecture looks like this. So you have an a event loop for all the incoming communication, so it's, let's call it the request-response event loop. And you typically have a specific number of worker threads. It's usually a function of number of cores in the machine. And then we have outgoing event, event, event loop uh, associated with each of the client, which is managing the outgoing communication. In order to take full, uh, full advantage of this asynchronous architecture, we need to code up the play data call a little bit differently. We want to mm, split the play data call into different independent execution units, which can run in parallel. For example, the get customer info and the get device info call can happen in parallel. And then when the results of both, are, both, the, both those calls is available, you can zip, it, zip them together and send it to a third call, which will be the device decide play data call. Let's see how the execution workflow will work in such a, such a call pattern. Say a request for play data comes in, and as soon as a, a request unit is available of the network buffer, the event loop will trigger one of the worker threads to execute the get play data call. The first call, all it does is that it sets up the entire execution and it immediately returns. A separate worker thread will fetch the customer info, and another separate worker thread will get the device info, and then there is another execution unit which will zip the results from the device info and the customer info, and then pass it on to the decide play data work execution thread, and once the play data call returns, we are able to return the response. As you can see, the workflow spans multiple threads. All context is passed as messages from one processing unit to another. If we need to follow and reason about a particular request, we need some form of tooling to assemble and capture these requests so that we can reason about it. And finally, none of the calls can block because 
uh, we have a limited number of worker threads, uh, and it is designed with uh, complete parallelization in mind. So if one of those worker thread blocks, it will significantly reduce the throughput of the service. So in an asynchronous architecture, we have an asynchronous request hand handler and a non-blocking I.O. So the question to ask is, do you really have a need beyond request response? If you did, then an asynchronous architecture might, you might benefit from an asynchronous architecture. However, for the purpose of play API servers, we try to tease apart what is a type one decision in this and what is a type two decision, and we decided to make both the IOs, the incoming IO and the outgoing IO, as uh, non-blocking. However, we kept the actual request processing itself as blocking so that we can reason about it. This enabled, uh, this solved for current use cases, but it also left room for future use cases. Certainly in one of the uh, business use cases, we are considering a bi-directional stream pattern, and when that use case arrives, we'll be able to extend this architecture to support that. So the type condition here between synchronous and asynchronous is, if most of your APIs fit the request response pattern, consider a synchronous request handler, but ensure that your IO is non-blocking. So that wraps up synchronous and asynchronous choices. The third type one decision is around data architecture. Whether you are breaking up a monolith uh, into microservices or you're restarting one of your microservices design, please consider the data architecture, like the, treat it as a number first class citizen, uh, because it deserves uh, that specific role. Without an intentional data architecture, <laughs> data becomes its own monolith. Let's take a look at what the situation was with Netflix here. So we have multiple data sources. Uh, for example, you can have um, encoding profile data, deployment status data, the title data, mm, the, all, all the localization data. And there are several services which consumes these data sources as is. This pattern looks similar to the distributed monolith situation because any change in data sources instantaneously impacts all the services which is consuming this data. From within the scope of the API servers, we have a subset of these data sources which we consume, and each of these data sources are uh, loaded in memory asynchronously as and when the new data becomes available. The first thing which we noticed was only a very small percentage of the data was actually getting used. So uh, it is a very inefficient use of all the resources, especially for a, a service like API service. And secondly, because there was a pervasive assumption of a lot of all these data sources being always being available across all the services, not only the API service was freely using all the data models from these data sources freely, but also all the shared libraries which it was consuming was also dependent on some of these data sources. So it became really non-trivial to unwind all the uh, use cases for the data sources. In fact, we don't even know what are all the data, uh, what all data sources are necessary to run the API service. The third observation was that whenever there was a data update, we could see that there was a correlated uh, degradation in performance. For instance, in this particular graph, you could see that whenever there was a data update, you could see an increase in CPU utilization. It also had increasing GZ pressure, uh, increase in latencies. So if, you, if, you're, if somebody comes and asks you what's your performance characteristic of an API service, we are unable to say that this is our steady state performance because it kept on varying depending on when, the, when there was a data update. And finally, some of the data updates can be catastrophic. Most of our uh, deployments are immutable, tested, and can I read. However, because these data updates happen asynchronously, it has the capability in this particular situation, almost for 40 minutes, our API servers was down. So we debated and uh, discussed as to what we want to do with these data sources. Without changing too much of the architecture of the data sources themselves, we want to isolate the Play API servers from the data in which it's consuming. So we said we were the, the classic uh, adage in computer science, right? All problems in computer science can be solved by another level of indirection. So that is, that is what we employed here. 
What we did was we created a service called the Data Loader Service. Instead of the Play API service consuming these data sources directly, we let the Data Loader Service consume all these data sources and all its refreshes. And whenever there is a new refresh of any of the data source, we would compute the data which is necessary for the Play API service, and we will convert the original data source into a materialized view which only the Play API service needs, and which we will store that into the data store. Separately, we also created an abstraction layer for the data store we call the data service, and it was a very uh, highly available, highly cached, high throughput service, uh, which enabled us to fetch all the data which is necessary in order to provide different business functions from within the Play API service. If you think, uh, let's, let me quickly go over the benefits of this, right? So it, it uses only the data it needs. It doesn't load all the data. It do, doesn't load any data in memory. And because it doesn't load any data in memory, we are having a very predictable operational characteristic. And a nice side effect of this is that the number of dependencies which we need to assemble within the Play API service was also significantly reduced. So if you think like building such a big redirection um, architecture for your data is uh, an overkill for your use case, at least consider building an abstraction or an anti-corruption layer so that whenever the need arises, you can remove the data source outside of the service into its own separate services. So the type foundation here is that for data architecture, isolate data from the service and then ensure that at least, a, if you don't want to isolate the data, at least ensure that there is a layer of abstraction. So that brings us to the close of all the three type foundations, which we think is necessary in order to build our architecture from fresh. For type two decisions, we suggest you choose a path, experiment, and iterate. It's simple because it's the, uh, the decisions are not consequential. For instance, what we did was we had around, within the Play API, maybe 20 odd APIs which I have to implement. We implemented one API. We figured out what is the integration pattern with the clients. We figured out our migration strategy. We figured out shadow st testing strategy. And then we learned from that, and then we moved on to the other APIs. So the guiding principle here is that identify what makes a, a type one and type two decision for your use case. Among the type one decisions, spend 80% of the time debating and aligning on the type one choices. And the third part of my talk is around evolvability. How many of you guys heard the term evolutionary architecture before? It's 20, 25%. So evolutionary architecture is a term coined by Rebecca Parsons and uh, Neil Ford from ThoughtWorks. They define it as such. They say an evolutionary architecture supports guided and incremental change as first principle among multiple dimensions. There are three key words here. First is it's designed for change, and every change is guided. And most importantly, we should be able to evolve across multiple dimensions. Let's tackle the multiple dimensions piece first. By choosing a microservices architecture with appropriate coupling, I think the appropriate coupling is, uh, requires the emphasis here, it allows us to evolve across multiple dimensions. The Play API service can evolve independently of the Play Decision service, which can evolve independently of the Customer Info service and the Device Info service. Each of the services should be able to evolve independently without impacting too much of other services in the ecosystem. With respect to change, let's understand how evolvable are the type one decisions. As I mentioned before, if you wanted to completely try an asynchronous architecture, Compared to the previous architecture, the current architecture is in a much better place because, as I mentioned, all we need to do was adopt an asynchronous framework and build an observability tools around it. Same with respect to polyglot services. At the very least, we are already able to uh, accept requests from a non-Java service and talk to a non-Java service. We are much better suited for developing bidirectional APIs and any additional data sources which comes into play in order to enable a new business function, and we are able to incorporate that effectively as well. In some sense, these are our known unknowns. We already designed our architecture with these in mind. So we ensured that our architecture was ex extendable along these dimensions. However, there might be some few potential type one decisions which may come in the next three, five years. At least within Netflix, some set of teams are seriously considering and have deployed a lot of their services and containers. 
And serverless is something which we have not even started to, uh, uh, we, we are probably dabbling with it a little bit. So uh, once we become really serious about these two, uh, and I'm sure like uh, uh, it will expose, uh, it, will, it will tell us whether how evolvable our services are. So these are in some sense our unknown unknowns, right? We fully expect that and uh, only time will tell how our architecture is able to evolve with those uh, choices. So typically, when you start an architecture fresh and you deploy it for the first few months, it's always uh, uh, things are looking rosy and nice and fine. But as new business uh, use cases come in, complexity usually creeps in, often at the cost of the original principles which guided the architecture. So the key question to ask is, as we evolve, how do we ensure that we are not breaking our original goals? Or if you are breaking, uh, it has to be an intentional choice to break that original goal. This is where fitness functions come into play. And this is what uh, evolutionary architecture also uh, suggests with respect to guided change. As part of every architecture's goal, we typically have the usual suspects like we want it to be highly available, we, have a, we want it to be late, low latency, uh, we want it to be reliable, resilient, and at Netflix we also care about like observability, simplicity, developer productivity. Sure, these goals themselves are interesting, but what we want is the relative importance of one goal with respect to one another. For instance, this is a fitness function for our Play API service. It actually categorizes each of our goals with relative importance to the other goal. A quick note of caution here, the fitness function for your service might be totally different and it, might be, uh, it should be tailored for your particular business use case. Let's go over a couple of choices here and why we made, why we ranked one goal higher uh, compared to the other one. For example, we have, we choose simplicity over reliability. As we talked earlier in the uh, talk, uh, we had a play decision service and uh, usually in order to improve the reliability of a service, we allow for fallbacks to happen. And then when the fallback happens, it increases the operational complexity of the calling service. Especially if the callbacks are, uh, if the fallbacks are uh, talking to a totally different service in order to service the fallback, or if it was a CPU-intensive uh, fallback logic itself. So, if the choice was to have a heavy fallback to improve reliability, or to keep the calling service simple, we want to choose simplicity. Similarly, we prefer scalability over throughput. Any form of uh, uh, in order to increase the throughput for any service, usually it includes some form of caching, right? Uh, in, in one particular case, what we noticed was if we just introduced an in-memory caching solution, uh, we were able to increase the throughput by 50%. However, in a dire situation where we want to quickly scale the, uh, horizontally scale our services because there is an increase in request load, this meant that we have to invest in some form of cache warming solution before we can allow the new instances to take traffic. So it meant that the throughput advantage came at the cost of scalability. So we decided to say like we, do, we, we prefer scalability and we decided not to go ahead with that solution. And finally, let's quickly touch upon why we prefer observability over latency. So if you designed a, a fully asynchronous solution, because of the advantages of like maximum parallelizing all the requests, uh, typically it results in low day, low, lower latencies. However, if you have to reason about what happened during a request workflow, we need to build separate observability tools in order to uh, do day-to-day -day functions about like debugging a particular issue. So when it comes to observability and latency, and if it has to be a choice between the two, we prefer observability. So those are guiding, uh, those are the fitness functions which guides us for any intentional changes. But then, in order to ensure that our service is not degrading due to any unintentional change, we have a separate set of fitness functions. These typically uh, take the form of alerts, metrics, monitoring, or in some cases, tests. For instance, we have alerts for our availability and latency SLAs. In order to ensure that we are only uh, 
taking in thin clients into the Play API servers, we have written tests to ensure that the dependency tree only contains dependencies which we've already whitelisted. And we also ensure that we always write tests to ensure for any non-critical service communication. If that communication fails, it doesn't bring down the API service. And for merge to deploy time, we usually have a monitoring dashboard. We keep track of how, how much the merge to deploy time is increasing or decreasing over, the, over time. So the guiding principle here is that divide, de define fitness functions to act as your guide for architectural evolution. So in terms of all the different attributes which we talked about, this is how the previous architecture stacks up with the current architecture. The current architecture has singular identities, operational isolation, almost limited or no binary coupling. It allows for asynchronous communication, it enables us to go beyond Java, and it has an explicit data architecture, and we have a, a set of fitness functions which is guiding us for evolution. Coming back to the initial graphs which I showed you at the start of the talk, with respect to the high availability goal, I'm happy to say that in the one year of its inception, we have not had any single incident in which the Play API service was a direct or an indirect contributor. And our goal of five deployments per week, in, for that goal we are averaging around like 4.5, that means almost all days, all weekdays during business hour we are shipping. And then we just had to do two rollbacks, that two not related to a customer facing issue, uh, but it is more, more around a data quality issue. So to summarize, I would encourage you guys to think about building an evolutionary architecture, build a strong domain-specific identity, ensure and iterate on that identity so that like, you can always keep the identity at the back of the mind while you are building your architecture. Invest in type 1 and type 2 decisions framework, determine what constitutes your type 1 decision, and spend 80% of the time debating and aligning on those choices. And finally, ensure that your architecture is ev evolvable across multiple dimensions, and use fitness functions to act as your guide. That's all I got. Thank you very much. Thank you.